The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to the chief priests and the elders of the people, Hear another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. Then he leased it to tenants and went on a journey. When vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to obtain his produce. But the tenants seized the servants and one they beat, another they killed, and a third they stoned. Again he sent other servants, more numerous than the first ones, but they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, thinking, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to one another, this is the heir, come, let us kill him and acquire his inheritance. They seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. What will the owner of the vineyard do to those tenants when he comes? They answered him, he will put those wretched men to a wretched death and lease his vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the proper times. Jesus said to them, did you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? By the Lord has this been done, and it is wonderful in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that will produce its fruit. The Gospel of the Lord. When I was a kid, I had an odd obsession with secret door novels. You know, stories like the Chronicles of Narnia, where you could open a wardrobe and pass through to a magical land. My parents would always say that my six-year-old self had a bit of a rambunctious imagination. I was convinced that secret doors really did exist, that you just needed to know where to look. And so I'd look for them in my parents' bedroom, in our creepy crawl space downstairs, in the place where my mom kept the bed sheets. I would just open people's closet doors and look for an adventure. I'd try to get the door closed and hide inside, digging my way through our downy fresh towels until I reached the back. And while I never found a light pole in the woods, or a room of requirement, or a mine of Moria, I'd still look. Because the stories told me that they were there. I knew there wasn't a talking lion in our linen closet, but in a way, I also knew that there was. It's a weird place, and certainly not just a place that kids can get to. Stories can get us to that place, right in the middle of fiction and reality. That place where a tale, no matter how strange, has some semblance of truth. It inspires the kind of wonder that makes us believe it. It's why folks in London visit 221B Baker Street and Platform 9 and 3 quarters. 
We know that Sherlock Holmes and Harry Potter aren't real, but we have feelings about them, and we're able to do that. We know that fictional characters aren't real, and yet we also know that they are. The parables of Jesus often meet us in just such a place. Stories of landowners and tenants, servants and sons, stories both real and fictional that we just can't help but believe. Stories that seem to be about us somehow. It's tempting, of course, to assign roles in the story to play who's who with the plot we're invited to enter, but that's not really how we're meant to hear them. The parables of Jesus offer us a different doorway into the story of salvation than the one offered to our Lord's contemporaries. Today's parable of the wicked tenants is no exception. Jesus said to the chief priests and the elders of the people, hear another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard put a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. Then he leased it to tenants and went on a journey. Notice who we're talking to here, the chief priests and elders of the people. Jesus tells them this parable right after his entry into Jerusalem, shortly before his passion. And he picks up the story right where Isaiah leaves it off in our first reading. He even uses the prophet's words. A landowner planted a vineyard, put a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. That's straight out of Isaiah. In Isaiah, the vineyard of the Lord is the house of Israel, God's choicest plant, God's cherished people. Despite planting it in fertile soil and spading it and clearing it of stones, Isaiah tells us that the vineyard's crop yielded wild grapes. It's a prophecy about the people of Israel that the chief priests and the elders would have known very well. So when Jesus starts his parable, they already sort of know where he's going. You can almost hear them finish the story, echoing Isaiah. Since the crop yielded wild grapes, the owner of the vineyard gave it over to ruin. He took away its hedge and let it be trampled. That's why we as a people have been conquered again and again, because our ancestors failed to live holy lives, to remain faithful to their covenant with the Lord. Come on, Jesus. Tell us something we don't know. But of course, that's not where Jesus is going in the parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and leased it to tenants. Tenants didn't feature in Isaiah. And of course, these tenants, we know, aren't the most upstanding of citizens. They beat and kill and stone the owner's servants when they come to collect at vintage time. Israel's religious leaders, the chief priests and the elders, are made to realize that they themselves might be these wicked tenants. That their continued rejection of all who may have served the owner, prophets and priests alike, their rejection of those servants will prove their undoing. It's a damning prediction. Therefore, Jesus says, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a people that will produce its fruit. That's where the chief priests and the elders encounter the story. But what about us? Where do we fit in? Are we the tenants? Are we the servants? 
I'm not sure we're either, actually. Remember, the parables of Jesus are meant to offer us a doorway into the story of salvation. They're meant to get us to that place right in the middle of fiction and reality where the characters we encounter can touch our hearts, engage us, affect us, challenge us, shape us. That's what any good story is supposed to do. Does the parable of the wicked tenants involve us? Does it draw us in? Does it give us an entry point? Absolutely. Friends, we're in the vineyard. Right now, as we pray together, as we celebrate this Eucharist, the sacrament of God's kingdom, we're in the vineyard. When we remember the gift of Christ's self-sacrificing love, we make present, here and now, in real time, the story of our salvation. And not only here, but wherever we encounter the good news of God's love for the world. St. Paul nails it in our second reading. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, that's the vineyard. That moment when our salvation becomes more than just a story. When we touch the incomprehensible glory of a God who became human so that we might become divine. Of a son who became human. That we might once more be sons and daughters of God. We're in the vineyard, the kingdom of God, where we find no tenants of doubt or despair, no loneliness or fear to keep us from grace, only servants of faith and hope and love, servants who know just how cherished we are by God, the vineyard owner who cultivates our lives, our hearts, our story in his everlasting peace.